Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. The American Professional Football Association, later to be named the National Football League, was founded on September 17, 1920. This was a momentous day in the history of the league. However, in this episode, I'm going to tell you about the life and career of the massive man that overshadowed the founding of the NFL. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is October 31st, 1897, and we are in a small town called Mansfield, Ohio, and this is where our hero was born. This time, our hero is Wilbur Francis Henry, who ended up getting the nickname Pete as a boy, and would basically follow him for the rest of his life, so we're going to call him Pete for the remainder of this episode. And him being born on Halloween would be what I call a fitting measure, because Halloween is a day that people kind of dress up and they can be whatever they want, and maybe it was the only day he could really fit in, because he he was just a massive kind of dude. So maybe he went as like King Kong, or uh, we talked about earlier with Red Grange, and not even Paul Bunyan's big blue ox had a mythical lore the size of Red Grange, and maybe that was actually, you know, Pete Henry back in the day. Because, like I said, this guy was just a massive individual. Now, his father's name was Ulysses, and his mother's name was Bertha. So, uh, (laughs) don't come at me, bro, with this, but uh, maybe, just maybe, that was the original Big Bertha. And that's where the the line came from, you know, Big Bertha. But, uh, like I said, don't come at me with this stuff, but I'm just saying. They were on a family farm, and dude eats everything in sight. So, naturally higher intake of calories than the output, you're going to gain a little bit of pounds. So this guy ended up weighing 215 pounds when he entered high school, which the school that he went to was Mansfield High School. So obviously, when he got into high school, there was a football coach, and he saw this big, massive dude walking through the halls. And he's like, uh, yeah, I'm going to recruit that guy because he's large enough to stop any ball carrier out there. As well as, big enough to be able to go ahead and, you know, all my arrows are going to blot out the sun. But it's just this one dude. One big, massive individual. But, you would think he'd play in the offensive line. But they had other plans for him. You see, this guy kind of reminded me of Chris Farley back in the day. A dude that was just, uh, a rather portly. But he had the speed and quickness and agility and you're like, the guy that size should not be able to move that way. So instead of putting him on the line, they decided to make him a fullback. Now just imagine, we talked about Bronco Nagurski and the size of that individual running through the hole at these measly little linebackers, but those were professional players. We're talking about back in high school, a 215 pound dude toting the rock, coming at you full head of steam. I mean, you've got two choices. Uh, on my left hand, it is try to stand in the way and probably get bowled over and then say my last prayers. Or it's, on the right hand, it's, I'm going to, you know, looking around, toss my arm out there, make it look like I try to tackle him and everything so, you know, coach doesn't get down my grill and stuff because obviously I'm not stopping this dude. And he would go on to play fullback for his entire high school career. I'm just thinking it's probably one of those deals where, 
when the opponents would play Mansfield, the coach of the other team would be like, you know, uh, hey, Johnny, you screwed up this week. You know, you got caught by the cops and stuff. So here's your punishment. You are middle linebacker. You're going to try to stop this guy named Pete Henry. And then the guy would be like, well, you know, telling all his friends and stuff. And you probably shouldn't do the drugs and stuff because coach is going to put you at middle linebacker. and You're going to stop that locomotive freight train, which ain't going to happen. Bad idea. Because he would have a great high school career, like I said, as a fullback. He was named the captain for a senior year, where he would lead the team to an 8-1 and record. And they said his best game came against Toledo Waite High School, which at the time was one of the toughest teams in Ohio, where he ended up scoring three touchdowns in a 31-7 to win. But by the end of his high school career, now remember I said 215 pounds entering high school, he registered in at five foot eleven, two hundred and forty five pounds. So um naturally, he was given the nickname I'm using air quotes here, fats. But still, it did not show the way he played. He was just an athletic dude. Kinda like I don't know, a hippopotamus. Oh, I remember. There was that one commercial where it was like a Yokozuna looking sumo wrestler and he was on ice skates and you're like well, that doesn't make sense. Maybe it's like a Geico commercial or something, but that's what this was like. Fats, Pete Henry, Wilbur Henry, you know, sounds like a pig, Wilbur. But he just had the gracefulness and speed and agility of that little Yokozuna dude doing that little pirouette kind of thing on the ice. So this swift feet that he had would end up landing him to, of course, a college where he's going to play some football. He went to Washington and Jefferson College, which was close to Pittsburgh. While at W&J College, he would compete in track, baseball, and basketball, of course, as well as football. He was the first player in school history to letter in four major sports, where he would end up acquiring 11 total letters. His head coach was Bob Falwell, which would end up going to become the first head coach of the New York Giants in 1925. So Falwell, in a, I don't know... Maybe a brilliant move. Maybe it could have turned out a different way. Who knows? He would end up moving him to tackle as a freshman because he wanted to give him a chance to play as a freshman, which, of course, you know, a freshman playing on the varsity offensive line is a pretty good deal. Now, skip it over a year. Sol Metzger ended up replacing Falwell as his head coach for two seasons, where he would end up helping Pete become honorable mention All-American for both of these seasons. So the 1918 season was basically a wash. They only played two games for the school because World War I had shut down the season. So Pete was given an extra year of eligibility to play in the 1919 season. Now again, remind you, this is college. So, you know, you have only so many years where you can play. But in 1919, we we're going to call this the season that created the legend of fats. Sounded a lot better on my tongue, in my head. I don't know maybe in my ear hole. But after a 4-0 start, a rumor had come out that he had played professional football for the Massillon Tigers. So of course, Pete said, you know what? Dang, dude, I did not do that. He would proceed to deny it in a newspaper article in the October 8th edition of the Canton Daily News. And the headline went as such, Big Tackle Denies Massillon Connection. And they had a quote from Pete in the article too. And it went like this, Apparently, someone has tried to put me in the wrong at Massillon. Not only did I not play with Massillon on Sunday, but I have no intention of playing professional football before I am through with my college course. I will admit that flattering offers have been made to me to play for a number of professional teams, but I have rejected all of them and certainly will maintain my amateur standings while I am in college. End quote. As discussed in an earlier episode, they had a lot of issues going on between college and professional ranks where they had a lot of college kids playing for the professional ranks under kind of like, you know, aliases and that kind of thing. Now, if I was picking an alias for Mr. Fats Henry, I would go with Olympus Mons. And for those of you that have no clue what I'm talking about, Olympus Mons is the largest mountain and volcano in our solar system, and it is on Mars. It towers above all other mountains and all other oncomers that are out there. So it also doubles as the perfect bodybuilder name. I have no clue if it's out there or not, but if you have aspirations to become a massive bodybuilder, I suggest you use the term Olympus Mons because it's no longer used by Pete Henry. 
But getting back to the claims that he played professional football and everything, the article I looked at from Professional Football Researchers Association stated that there were numerous W and J fans that vouched for him and stating that the only time he left the campus that day was for a short car ride less than 10 miles. So nothing kind of came about it, and he continued to play college, and he ended up leading the team to a 6-2 and record, and Pete would be named to Walter Camp's first All-American team. Several pro teams would, of course, reach out after the football season, trying to lure him in with a big old contract. But he says, you know what? I'm not down with that, because I have to honor everything that this college did for me. And I'm going to continue by helping the school out and playing collegiate track and field. And here's a quote that came from Pete describing what he meant. No thanks. I'm a weight thrower on the track team and they'll need me this spring. I'll stay an amateur until then. It's the least I owe the college. End quote. And he would end up graduating in June of 1920. And then it was time, finally, for him to get into the pros. But before I get into Wilbert Pete Henry's professional football career, I want to remind you to head to thefootballhistorydude.com slash episode 14 for the show notes. And make sure you mash that little subscribe button on your podcast player choice so you get the freshest, hottest out the press episodes each and every week. I'd also appreciate an honest review of the show so I know how I'm doing. But let's get into his professional career. He made the decision to play for the best team in the land, the Canton Bulldogs at the time, under Ralph Hay, and with the best player in the league, Mr. Jim Thorpe. So, I guess they had a bargaining chip. It's like, hey, you know, we're the best. Why not come play for us? So he did. And that announcement would be made on the same day as another big event, which we found out in a previous episode. That date was September 17th, 1920. Does that day ring a bell to you? Well, it should. It was the day that Ralph Hay gathered a bunch of ragtag dudes into his little auto showroom, and they would end up founding what would become the National Football League. But even though that meeting actually was by far and away more important, the signing of this behemoth massive individual actually stole the show. It overshadowed the meeting, and the headlines in the Canton Repository read as such, Bulldogs land Big Wilbur Henry. 235 pound tackle from WJ, all American. And in the article, it went as such Buck of Wisconsin, Edwards of Notre Dame, Kellison of West Virginia Wesleyan, Smith of the Michigan Aggies, and Lowe of Fordham were all good tackles, corking good ones. But they haven't a thing on the husky youngster just signed for the Canton Bulldogs of 1920, Wilbur Henry of Mansfield. The signature of Henry to a Bulldog contract was announced Friday morning after manager Hay had received a telegram to that effect. He is the most notable addition to Jim Thorpe's crew of professionals and commands a fancy salary. But it will be worth it in playing ability and drawing power. Henry plans to come to Canton for the season and practice with the rest of the champions. End quote. Like I said, the Canton Bulldogs were the prized possession. They were the champions. They were the best team in the land. And in the first season, which would end up being the first season of the newly formed American Professional Football Association, in 1920, the team would go 7, 4, and 1. But Jim Thorpe would end up leaving after the season. So they would go through kind of like a little bit of a transition phase. And we talked a little bit about this in some previous episodes. Um, in 1921, the Bulldogs would finish 5, 2, and 3, and they were still looking for a new leader. So then later, which this is that part I was talking about, Guy Chamberlain will come from George Hallis's Decatur Staley's, and he would end up becoming what I said is possibly the first big free agent. So maybe we have a little bit of a stability factor now. Yes, we lost Jim Thorpe, the legend, but we have Guy Chamberlain, and we have Wilbur Pete Henry, you know, Fats Henry, holding down the line on both sides of the ball. So in 1922, the team ended up starting 4-0-2, including a 7-6 victory over Hallis and the newly founded Chicago Bears. Then on November 12, 1922, Fats Henry, yes, our hero, would have a game against the Buffalo Americans 
that is considered possibly his greatest game ever played as a pro. The Canton newspaper will kind of have something to say about this too. There was a quote that went as such. Henry's play marked the greatest game he has ever played for Canton, and it came close to being the most remarkable performance ever given by a lineman on a local field. End quote. In this year, P would end up leading the Bulldogs to a record of 10, 0, and 2. So basically, yes, undefeated. And they would have the first, when I'm using again, quotes, NFL title. Because if you remember from a previous episode, that was the year in 1922 where the league actually officially changed the name to the National Football League. And in this season, the defense gave up only 15 points in 12 games. And of course, Pete played a huge role shutting down the offenses for the other team. Because he was just this massive, great wall of China, swarming kind of defense type of dude. So George Hallis would vote Pete to his first team all-pro team. So even though Pete's best game of his career, from what they said, came in 1922, his 1923 season was considered his best full season combined. Now he was playing again Buffalo All-Americans, and they were in the middle of an unbeaten streak in 19 games. En route to what we talked about earlier was a record 25 games unbeaten. And of course, Pete played a huge role in this. Just to kind of give you a refresher, the Canton Bulldogs still hold the record for the most games played without a loss. They went 25 total games without being defeated. Of course, there were some ties in there because the points weren't flinging around as much as they are nowadays. But that still is a record, basically almost 100 years later. But going back to this game, where they were in the middle of, at the time, only 19 games of unbeaten against the Buffalo All-Americans, which were kind of like a rival at the time. There was another quote to kind of sum it up for him. When it's such, The world champions can thank their lucky stars that Wilbur Henry was with the team Sunday. The big fellow not only turned defeat into victory when the case seemed hopeless, but played a wonderful game from the start until a spectacular climaxing act in the last few seconds. Canton deserved a victory, end quote. So, kind of like to sum it up for the 1923 season for this guy, he would finish second in scoring. Yeah, that's a, a big tackle, the offensive tackle and the defensive tackle. He would end up scoring 59 points. You're like, well, how did he do that? Dude had a foot, which was a precursor to Sebastian Janikowski, another kind of a portly individual, but he could boom that ball. He scored 59 points. Well, 59 wasn't as big of a deal nowadays, but back then it got him to the ranks of second in the league. He had nine field goals and 26 extra points. And get this, he also caught a TD pass from the tackle spot, which nowadays might seem like, oh yeah, it doesn't happen that much, but I guess so, you know. Back then it was like, what? Another one of those mind blown kind of moments and they're like this doesn't register in my comprehension scale and I don't know what to do and then they got that men in black little flasher red thing in my eyes and took the button and don't remember it and now I'm back in and we're just go ahead let's keep going so of course he was considered the best player in the league in 1923 now they didn't give out an MVP at the time but of course the article said he definitely would have gotten it if they were given out an MVP award. So, he ended up playing in Canton's last ever game in the NFL. But then he played a little bit for the Pottsville Maroons and the New York Giants. But, we really don't have to talk about those teams. It was the career with the Canton Bulldogs that really was everything for him. And after playing football, he would end up becoming an assistant coach for basketball and football at his alma mater, Washington and Jefferson. Then on August 16th, 1931, he was named the athletic director for WNJ, where he would hold that spot for the next 21 years. Then on February 7th, 1952, he would pass away from a diabetic infection. But he would live long enough to be able to see himself inducted to the College Football Hall of Fame in 1951. And unfortunately, he didn't live to see this. He would also be inducted to the inaugural class of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. In 1963. Then, in February of 1971, Washington and Jefferson dedicated a multi purpose sports complex as the Henry Physical Education Center, which they later named the Henry Memorial Center. 
To kind of sum it up a little bit, I'm going to leave you with a quote that was pulled out from the Hall of Fame speech given by Harry Robb, who was a teammate of Pete's when they were with the Canton Bulldogs. And the quote goes as such. I consider it a great honor to have this privilege of receiving this bust for Pete Henry from the Hall of Fame. My only regret is that Pete is not here to receive it in person. Pete, in my estimation, is the greatest lineman that ever played football. Pete Henry was the perfect tackle. End quote. Now I'm going to leave you with this too. Wilbur Pete Henry was a dominating 60-minute player for his entire career. He was unmatched during his time on the offensive and defensive lines which earned him many accolades throughout his career. Pete was also inducted to the College and Pro Football Hall of Fames. However, it was his kicking and punting prowess that earned him one of the most unique stats. He had a punt that at the time was by far and away an NFL record. Fast Henry had a punt that sailed an incredible 94 yards. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Football History Dude and we're able to gain some knowledge nuggets about the perfect tackle. If you would like to give feedback to the show, please head over to thefootballhistorydude.com slash contact, or hit me up on Twitter. My handle is at FHDude. In the upcoming episode, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the career for four of the eight inductees to this year's Professional Football Hall of Fame class. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.